Now, without further ado, I'd like to, to move on to welcome our speaker today, who is um, our fellow, Christopher de Hamel, uh, who many of you, I'm sure, might have read about in book reviews um, over the past year or so, because Christopher um, wrote a book which I think has been on so many people's Christmas wish list. Um, I'm putting it on my birthday wish list, I think. Meetings of Remarkable Manuscripts, which um, was a book which um, distilled a lifetime which Christopher has spent working with manuscripts and books um, in the, in the, with Sotheby's, but also um, with Corpus Christi College um, and other institutions. And what was so wonderful about this book um, is that it does what any curator and person who works with objects wants to do, which is actually to really look into these objects and tease out their history, tease out what makes them great, teach out how, to find out how they came to where they are today. So, you know, the best sort of detective stories. Um, today, uh, Christopher, who we should congratulate for recently winning the Wolfson History Prize, is going to talk about um, something else which is not in the book. And he's going to talk about um, Archbishop Thomas Beckett's book, uh, Library of Books. Now, you all know Thomas a. Beckett. Um, he is just the sort of person whom the antiquaries uh, have always been passionate about researching, finding out about. And if you go to the British Museum, you'll see one of the antiquaries' great treasures, which is a wonderful Limoges casket with the martyrdom of Thomas a. Beckett uh, on show in the medieval gallery there on long-term loan from the society. So Christopher today is going to tell us about Beckett I guess a little bit about his life, but about his books, the manuscripts he owned, what happened to them. And this coincides with the unexpected and recent discovery of Beckett's Psalter kept on his shrine in the cathedral throughout the Middle Ages. So I'm very much looking forward to those lectures. I'd ask you to welcome Christopher de Ham. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I open, as is appropriate here, with the famous Beckett reliquary casket, which you've just heard about, given to the Society of Antiquaries by Sir William Hamilton in 1801. It depicts the martyrdom of Thomas Beckett in Canterbury Cathedral on the 29th of December, 1170. That was an event which shocked all of Europe. A bit like the assassination of Kennedy or the death of Diana, probably everyone then alive remembered forever precisely where they were standing when they first heard the news of Beckett's murder. It became one of the great stories of the Middle Ages. There are also fragments of a medieval account of the life of Beckett in verse upstairs here in the Library of the Antiquaries. I don't really recall when I myself first learnt about Beckett, but as a late teenager in New Zealand, I took several holiday jobs in the Alexander Turnbull Library in Wellington, then in the building shown here, um, where I came to know their most important medieval manuscript. It's a 12th century volume on music, and the especial interest is that the volume uh, was recorded, as I myself first found, in the 1160s, in the teaching collection of the cloisters of Canterbury Cathedral. This really caught my imagination, for I'd been with my parents to see the swashbuckling 1960s film of Beckett with Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole. And it was exciting to me to think that the manuscript in Wellington had actually been in the cathedral at that very time. On my return to England for graduate work, even before, even before presenting myself at university, I made a pilgrimage, almost literally by foot, from Winchester to Canterbury, my first visit there, to see the cloister where the manuscript on music had been kept, and to stand on the site where Beckett himself had been martyred. My subsequent thesis in Oxford was on 12th century glossed books of the Bible and their origins. These were really the first privately owned books in Europe. And I was particularly anxious to find datable examples of such books acquired by individuals. As it happens, one of the earliest lists of glossed 
biblical books is the record of the volumes brought back to England by Thomas Beckett himself when he returned to Canterbury from exile in France in early December 1170, a few weeks before his death. It's reported that when Beckett fled into exile in 1164, he took nothing with him. William Fitzstephen describes the Archbishop staying at the Cistercian Abbey of Pontigny in Burgundy, gathering and commissioning there the latest and finest manuscripts from wherever he could find them in France. And then the Chronicle of William of Canterbury records Beckett arriving back in Sandwich in Kent on the 2nd of December 1170, as shown here, bringing home with him the wonderful new library he'd assembled while he was abroad. For most of the Middle Ages, these manuscripts were kept together in Canterbury Cathedral on shelves in the Slipe, the passageway of the southeast corner of the cloister, which some of you may know as the place where the cathedral vergers keep their bicycles and the gardeners their potting plants. <laughs> Beckett's library was catalogued there in the late 13th century in the library inventory prepared under the supervision of Prior Eastry, whose tomb still survives in the cathedral. And Eastry's list was printed in 1903 by M.R. James, paleographer and writer of ghost stories. Here they are, beginning on the left-hand side, the Libri Sancti Tome, the books of St. Thomas. There are 71 volumes described, entirely credibly, as having belonged to Beckett. The numbering of them is printed as running from 783 to 853, since these are part of M.R. James's arbitrary numeration of the entire library of the Canterbury monks. It's remarkable what a lot you can tell about a person by looking at their books. Even now, when some new acquaintance invites you home and while they're out of the room fetching the drinks, you run your eye critically <laughs> along the shelves. I have to say that I love medieval inventories. They're a form of licensed impertinence. You can rummage through the cupboards and poke your nose impolitely into other people's possessions of 800 years ago, and it's called research. <laughs> My first impression from Eastry's list of Beckett's books is that here was a man needing education in a hurry. There are introductions to grammar and rhetoric and quick handbooks on clerical life and church law. There are no heavy authors, slow to read, like Jerome and Augustine, but instead Beckett had gathered the very latest summaries and encyclopedias and dictionaries. And above all, there is an almost complete set of the gloss on the Bible, the medieval Google of scriptural interpretation. At least several of Beckett's actual manuscripts still survive and can be matched up with items on that list. In those student days of long ago, I went to look at them in their current locations, all as it happens in Oxford or Cambridge. They do seem to confirm that these are indeed mostly books which had been gathered while Beckett was in exile in France. Here, yeah, you probably can't read it, is the second page of the list as printed by M.R. James. There are a striking number of Cistercian texts, including works by St Bernard himself, consistent with the acquisition of books while Beckett was in residence at Pontigny. For example, number 833 in the numbering here is a treatise by Odo of Morimund on number symbolism. And here is the actual manuscript. It's now in the Wren Library at Trinity College in Cambridge among the manuscripts given by Archbishop Whitgift, and you can just make out an erased medieval inscription along the top of the first page, naming it as having belonged to Sancti Tome Archiepiscopi. Here I have marked the words Sancti and Tome with blue arrows. The author was a Cistercian monk who had died in 1161. And the manuscript is absolutely Cistercian in style, with those characteristic monochrome initials without gold, as decreed by Bernard as appropriate for production by Cistercian monks. This is its opening initial, closely paralleled in its one-colour decoration in manuscripts such as this. 
made for the Cistercian Abbey of Villers in Brabant. Becket spent nearly two years with the Cistercians in Pontigny, and there also survives a library catalogue from Pontigny at precisely that date. And in that thesis of more than 40 years ago, I matched up texts on Becket's book list with those which we know were available for copying at Pontigny. There are many of them, mostly sermons and quick fix guides to instant erudition. Doubtless the kind of text that Beckett or his advisers felt he needed with some urgency. That alone tells us an intimate fact about the man himself. There are several classical texts on Beckett's book list. They are rarities for such a date. Two survive. There's this. The second volume of Beckett's Livy, number 816 on prior history's list, now also in Trinity College, Cambridge. And this, in Magdalen College in Oxford, the copy of the Variae of Cassiodorus, which is number 835 in Eastry's catalogue and is recognisable from the shelf mark at the top of the right-hand page. Distinctio 2, Gradus 10, the second side of the slide, shelf 5, where Beckett's books were stored. Then there are also the glossed books of the Bible, which is what I was especially anxious to see such as this, Beckett's Gloss Pentateuch, the first item on the book list, now in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And this, from his volume of The Minor Prophets with Gloss, now in Trinity College, Cambridge. And this, from his Gloss volume of The Four Gospels, number 799 among Beckett's books, listed in the slide. These are books for use, but they are luxuriously and richly illuminated, not remotely austere Cistercian texts from Pontigny. And in these, we can glimpse the famous extravagance of Beckett's taste. There were also, they were also brand new texts in the 12th century, and Beckett's library was extremely up to date. That too is interesting. The manuscripts were doubtless professionally illuminated and they are not at all the work of monks. The manuscript of the Four Gospels includes a portrait of a scribe at the beginning of Luke, possibly a priest, but certainly not a Cistercian monk. And the wonderful initial to the right shows a battle between two knights, serenaded from the top left by a cat with a violin. Here's a detail. <laughs> Doubtless from the iconographic tradition to which we also owe Hey Diddle Diddle the Cat with a Fiddle. <laughs> in the initial for the opening of John's Gospel, in the same manuscript, is what appears to be an image of the manuscript's patron, as you see here at the top, clearly an archbishop wearing the pallium of Canterbury with a scribe or companion below, in this case not a monk at all, looking up at him. This archbishop may very well be an unnoticed contemporary portrait of Becket himself. There seems to be another here too. This is from the author's copy of the manuscript of Herbert of Bosham's edition of the Great Gloss on the Psalter, which, as Herbert writes in the preface, was commissioned by Becket when they were staying together at Pontigny. In fact, it was never finished in Becket's lifetime and it remained the property of Herbert of Bosham himself, who eventually be bequeathed it to the cathedral. The picture there presumably shows Herbert and Thomas Beckett, with his name just visible above, Sanctus Thomas Martyr et Pontifex. In the thesis, I argued that all these luxury glossed books were all made in Paris, which is where the texts originated. I don't actually know now whether this is right, and I may have overstated the case. One, at least, the Twelve Minor Prophets, is signed by an undoubted English scribe, Roger of Canterbury, who was doubtless a member of Becket's household in France. Anyway, I eventually wrote all this up into a slim book, now long out of print, with a picture on the front cover of a manuscript once attributed, almost certainly wrongly, to the possession of Becket. In 1975, I joined Sotheby's not far from here, as cataloguer of medieval manuscripts. Among many other things, I was responsible there for the rediscovery and eventual sale in 1986 of what are now called the Beckett Leaves, the earliest illustrated life of the saint. I showed you one detail a moment ago. Here's another. 
illustrating Beckett giving the one finger of defiance to Henry II, and another in which his petition is brought to the Pope. I also participated peripherally, but not so closely, in the Sotheby sale of another 12th century Beckett chasse made to enclose relics of the saint, like the one here at the Antiquaries, but this one formerly at Peterborough Abbey, and now in the Victorian Albert Museum. Both the leaves and the chasse still hold record prices, both for any English manuscript at auction and, I think, for any work of art bought by the v Clearly, the magic name of Thomas Beckett still has potency in the modern world. In the summer of 2000, I took my second and only other job as fellow librarian of Corpus Christi College in Cambridge, from which I retired five months ago. My employer for 17 years was Matthew Parker, born 1504, died 1575, former Master of Corpus and subsequently first Archbishop of Canterbury in the reign of Queen Elizabeth. He was responsible for what is known as the Elizabethan Settlement, which was the establishment of the Church of England as the religion of state, which it still is, unless Mr Corbyn abolishes it on Friday morning. <laughs> Here is Parker's working draft of the 39 Articles of 1562, def the defining document of the Anglican Church. At least initially, it was not Protestant and certainly not Lutheran. The English Church was to be Catholic, but just not Roman. This is the clause in the original. The Bishop of Rome hath no jurisdiction in this realm of England. Parker was a Brexit man. He believed that St Augustine of Canterbury had intended to set up an independent English church unfettered by Rome and that it had all gone wrong when we joined the European Union in 1066. <laughs> and he therefore obtained licence from the Privy Council to take into his own custody the oldest manuscripts in England in order to demonstrate with tangible evidence the antiquity and distinctive Englishness of Episcopal religion in this country. That is why the Parker Library was formed. Matthew Parker was especially interested in the history of the Archiepiscopacy, Archiepiscopacy of Canterbury. He saw himself as the 70th Archbishop in an unbroken line back through Thomas Becket to St Augustine and even through the apostolic succession of Gregory back to St Peter himself. Parker wrote the lives of his predecessors, published in 1571. This shows the opening of his long account on Archbishop Becket. He was also assiduous in locating and gathering medieval lives of Becket, which are not common, such as this by John Grandison, Bishop of Exeter, and this which he probably obtained from Lincoln Cathedral, and this which is a unique life of Becket in Middle English verse. What's touching about this particular manuscript is that it had belonged to Thomas Cranmer, who'd signed it, and who was himself an Archbishop Thomas, who was also about to be martyred when he was burnt at the stake in Oxford in 1556. Parker also had Matthew Paris's drawing of Beckett's own martyrdom nearly 400 years earlier. For me, at least, one of the most evocative treasures of the Parker Library is the primary copy of the Polycraticus of John of Salisbury, which was one of the books actually owned by Beckett himself. The author was a close friend of Beckett and had accompanied him in exile. I had not managed to see the manuscript when I was writing my thesis. I had written to the then fellow librarian at Corpus applying to look at it, and, as was the custom in those days, he simply refused me admission. I was rather upset. Even today, the Parker Library is still the only manuscript collection in the world to which I've ever been declined access. <laughs> it therefore gives me particular pleasure to show you Parker Library Manuscript 46. Here it is again, <laughs> with the opening of Book 5. This is one of the books I've often brought out for visitors, for it still continues to give me a thrill to touch and to turn the pages of a book once owned by Thomas Beckett himself. I think it's probably my favourite book in the Parker Library, and if the fellows would like to give me a present to mark my recent retirement, 
I would accept gratefully. <laughs> the Polycraticus is really the first English text on political science and on the relationship of kings to their subjects and, and on the necessary deference to the church, precisely the topic of the controversy with Henry II. And it is almost inconceivable that Beckett didn't read the manuscript or have it read to him. Beckett's manuscript in the Parker Library has a good many nota marks added by some 12th century reader, drawing attention to passages of particular interest. No examples of Beckett's handwriting are known, and it would be interesting to know whether these markings have any bearing on the controversy. Here's another. The manuscript matches up with item 853 in that inventory of books owned by Beckett, as in this rather fuzzy scan, where the wording corresponds almost exactly with that on the front flyleaf of the book, shown here, the Polycraticus of John of Salisbury and his Metalogicum. And then it did say, Sancti Tomia Martyris of St Thomas the Martyr. And so they knew it was his copy. But when Beckett's shrine was destroyed and his name was deleted from history by Henry VIII in 1538, one of the monks, or a subsequent owner, must have scraped away the name to preserve the book. It was a distinctively Canterbury custom to transcribe the wording of that inventory onto the flyleaf of a book, a point to which we will return later. The shelf mark above, you can see it here, Distinctio 2, Gradus 10, is the location among Beckett's books in the slide, similar to the numbering which we saw in the Cassiodorus at Magdalen College in Oxford. Second bookcase, shelf 10. Let's come back to the storage of Beckett's books in the Middle Ages. The manuscripts were marked with his name as the previous owner, as in the Polycraticus and the Livy, and they were shelved together, but only as part of the working library of the Cathedral Priory, with all the other miscellaneous book acquisitions of the 12th and early 13th centuries. It's an odd fact that although Beckett was almost immediately declared a saint and was canonised in 1173, the books which he had owned personally were simply sent across for storage in the daily reference collection of the monks. The martyrs' books were not regarded as religious relics. Canterbury Cathedral preserved and greatly venerated many other items associated with their new saint, recorded in detail in successive inventories, including two mitres, a gold one in which he was first buried and the white one he actually used, his embroidered gloves, his hair shirt, his bedclothes and bed hangings, his belt, his monastic cowl, his flail made of thongs, his chasuble, his sandals, and even his mackintosh, if I correctly interpret capa pluviali <laughs> in the cathedral inventory. But his books were simply shelved with other miscellaneous donations to the library of the Priory. Among the relics still exhibited in the cathedral of Sens in France are 12th century vestments said to have been used there by Beckett and those very many Beckett reliquaries, here's another one, uh, this one now in France, attest to a huge industry in the supposed body parts or other intimate possessions of the saint, but these do not include books. The monks of Canterbury operated the biggest pilgrim site in Christendom, and they exhibited items or places in the cathedral with only the most tenuous association with the saint. The equivalent of the postcard shop in Canterbury Cathedral sold items like this, which is also from the collection of the Society of Antiquaries, a little container for holy water which had touched the shrine and was reputed to do miracles. As it's not a word I use much, I'm not actually sure whether it's pronounced ampula or ampula. However, both monks and pilgrims were oddly indifferent to the martyr's library, then still in the cathedral. It's very strange. There's good historical uh, case for suggesting that the famous Eadwin Salter, now at Trinity College in Cambridge, was commissioned by Beckett. But if it was, the monks of the cathedral neither recorded the fact nor cared. They even discarded some of Beckett's books when the library was rehoused in the early 15th century. Duplicate texts from the cathedral were at that time sent up to Canterbury College in Oxford in the late Middle Ages, 
for classroom use and eventual destruction by students. And at least two of these were culled from Beckett's own shelf, and they knew it, blandly giving away the saints' personal volumes of the old and new digest on Roman law. Like all good toys taken to school, they never came back. The Cassiodorus of Magdalen College was already in Oxford by the 1480s, by which time its association with St Thomas Beckett had been entirely forgotten. This all shows a very interesting difference of attitude between the Middle Ages and now. If we had a pair of socks, for example, which had been worn by William Shakespeare, or even some strands of his hair, I am inventing examples, they would have only minor curiosity value for us. But a book from Shakespeare's library, if such a thing existed, and it doesn't, and especially if it had signs of use by him, would be an incomparable treasure for us today, for it would be a window into the intellect and the soul of the man. It was the other way round in the Middle Ages. Books, mere books, once owned or used by medieval saints, did not generally have the status of relics. One day, not long ago, I had the Bible historian Isle Polleg to lunch at Corpus in Cambridge, and I remarked conversationally over coffee afterwards something along the lines of what I've just outlined, which is the oddity that books in medieval England were not regarded as relics. Isle said that he knew of a medieval reference to what had clearly once been an exception. He tapped at his laptop, which he had with him, and he brought up an entry datable to 1321 in the sacrist role of Canterbury Cathedral, describing an important but never traced manuscript among the relics of the cathedral, apparently used in the liturgy around the shrine of Thomas Becket in Canterbury. It begins in Latin. Item, textus cum solterio sancti tome, Ar argento deorato coopatus gemis ornatis, and I had one of those sudden, heart-stopping shivers of recognition which make our lives as antiquaries worthwhile, for I have seen those words before. Here they are, almost word for word, at the end of a portable Psalter, manuscript 411, now also in the Parker Library, recording, and I translate approximately, this Psalter, with silver gilt boards, ornamented with jewels, formerly belonged to N, Archbishop of Canterbury, and eventually came into the possession of Thomas Becket, late Archbishop of Canterbury, as is witnessed in the old inscription. We rushed across to the library at once, and I fetched out the manuscript. We gazed at it together, trembling with excitement. The writing shown here is post-medieval, from the period of Matthew Parker. It might even have been added after the manuscript reached Cambridge. The book is now missing its front flyleaf, where, as we saw in Beckett's Polycraticus, the wording of any Canterbury inventory would also normally have been written. But it is, um, and so that is what the reference is to the old inscription. But it's no longer there. The present binding to is 18th century. The manuscript itself dates from around the year 1000. Its origin was once assumed to be continental, perhaps from Reims or Tour, as M. R. James suggested in his catalogue of the Parker Library. But it's actually written by the same scribe as the contemporary Boethius with Old English gloss, also among Parker's books and certainly from Canterbury. The prayer to all confessors in the Psalter opens with invocations of St. Gregory and St. Augustine of Canterbury, Evangelist of England and a Canterbury provenance is more or less absolute. Prayers added to the manuscript in the 12th century are in that distinctive prickly hand, characteristic of the scribes of the cathedral scriptorium after the Norman conquest, and we'll return to these later. The passage of a manuscript from Canterbury Cathedral into Parker's possession is very simple, for that was his single largest source of acquisitions. As archbishop, he simply helped himself to anything he wanted. There's not really much doubt that this was a former cathedral manuscript and that it is indeed the actual book described in the Sacrist Road in the 1320s. 
The inscription referring to N, Archbishop of Canterbury, is strange because the only medieval candidate would have been Nothelm, Archbishop, for six years in the early 8th century. Clearly impossible. And the assumption is that it's a general term, no men, unnamed anonymous, and that the Psalter is being attributed to possession by unspecified archbishops. An unusual feature of the book is that it has a second litany by another scribe with, and I have marked these in the first and eighth lines, the names of St. Vincent, twice, and Eustace, both written in capitals. Curiously, the Benedictine Abbey of Abingdon had relics of both Eustace and Vincent, and so it has sometimes been proposed that the Psalter might have been from there. That's not necessary if we accept that it was originally used by unspecific Archbishops of Canterbury. For its first owner was then surely Elfridge, Archbishop from 995 to 1005, who had himself previously been a monk of Abingdon Abbey. If it was a private prayer book for the use of an Archbishop, then this makes sense. Now, let's return to the Sacrist Inventory of 1321. I've subsequently been to look at the original in the British Library. It's describing items actually kept on or around Beckett's glittering shrine. This is an imagined view of what it might have looked like before its total destruction in 1538. The entry begins, item, textus cum solterio. Textus in this context means a binding, from the, word, from the verb tegera texi tectum, to cover. The word is commonly used for gospel books in jewel bindings, but it refers to the decorated cover, not the inside. The same sacrist roll includes three items described as textus sine libro, empty ornamental book covers. The binding of Beckett Psalter is described in further detail. It was silver gilt with ornate gems around the edges with an ivory in the centre showing Christ in majesty holding a book between four engraved evangelists. Since manuscript 411 dates from around the year 1000, the likelihood is that we have here a description of an unrecorded Anglo-Saxon treasure binding. In fact, it's almost impossible in England that a jewel binding was anything but Anglo-Saxon. The famous example surviving intact is on the 11th century Gospels of Judith of Flanders, Countess of Northumbria, now in New York, similarly with Christ in majesty, but this time all in gold. Notice the nails which hold the metalwork in place. Another once belonged to Countess Godifu, sister of Edward the Confessor, who gave it to Rochester Cathedral, described as ornamented with silver and precious stones. Beckett's manuscript was obviously much smaller, and it had, as I said, an ivory of Christ in majesty holding a book. Could that be something like the little late 10th century Anglo-Saxon ivory of exactly this subject now in the British Museum? The date and size would fit perfectly. The ornament on Beckett's Psalter was on one cover only, presumably the back. The last page of Corpus 411 was up against the binding. It shows offsets from the edges of nails around the edges, like those in the Judith of Flanders volume, except in the middle, where two pins perhaps secure the central upright ivory. Even from the inventory alone, we might have guessed that Beckett's Psalter must have been something much older than Beckett's lifetime. Treasure bindings were not characteristic of the 12th century. Beckett, as we saw in his glossed manuscripts, had a taste for luxury and show. Would he have used a jewel binding at all? Look at this. This mosaic is the oldest known image of Beckett as a saint in Montreal in Sicily, probably based on information from people who knew him personally, including Joan of Sicily, daughter of Henry II, and Beckett's own nephew who lived there. The Beckett casket owned by the antiquaries was found in southern Italy and is evidence of his relics down there too. The book shown in his hand in the mosaic in Sicily is the right size for a Psalter. It is indeed jewelled on the back cover. Nearer to home is this. 
in the windows of the north side of Trinity Chapel in Canterbury, immediately above Beckett's shrine, where his jewel psalter was probably displayed. There is uncertainty as to how much of this image is a modern replacement, and it may be of no value to us that Thomas Beckett is shown holding a book of exactly the right size with decoration on its lower cover, unless, of course, it's based or on or is part of the lost original window of around 1200. Let's look inside the Psalter. It's decorated in the so-called Franco-Saxon style, rare but not unknown in England around the year 1000, including one initial which seems to be only partly painted. It is the last moment of survival of the old Irish or Celtic style found in much earlier insular manuscripts such as the Book of Kells. Look at those panels of interlace in the Psalter and compare this from the Book of Kells itself. The real puzzle is the manuscript's frontispiece. This is not relevant to the Beckett story, but it's very odd. The assumption is that the page was originally unfinished and that the central compartment was left blank with an empty border, afterwards completed in an early 11th century hand. It's one of the most famous and widely published examples of Anglo-Saxon line drawing. It's assumed to represent David, but he is not shown as a king or with his harp, as one would expect in a normal Anglo-Saxon Psalter, as here. The drawing of the standing man in manuscript 411 does not obviously fit that tradition. Here's the strange thing. At the foot of the drawing are two tiny initials, WS, in a hand which cannot be medieval. I am at a loss to explain them. To my eye, they look like the same ink as the drawing of the man. The question then is whether the drawing could be an 18th or 19th century forgery added by WS to fill a blank space. There were English facsimilists around 1800, like John Harris and George Tupper, whose work was so good that it's almost impossible to fault except that they customarily subscribe their own initials. Mm -hmm. Yet, surely, the quality is too high and too convincing to have been invented, since there's nothing, known to me at least, from which the picture is copied. Could those initials be those of some reader or admirer in the Parker Library? Given the collection's notorious inaccessibility, even then, this seems unlikely. The candidates might have been William Stanley, who catalogued the manuscripts in 1722, or William Stukeley, FSA, Fellow of Corpus, but I simply don't know. Be that as it may, let's come back to the inscription about the manuscript coming into the possession of Thomas Beckett. This has, of course, been noticed before. All others who've written about the book have made fun of it, mocking the credulity of Matthew Parker. It's commonly cited as a classic example of, El of Elizabethan fantasy, a piece of preposterous and romantic invention. As recently as the new catalogue of illuminated manuscripts in Cambridge, published in 2013, it's, dis it's dismissed as almost certainly a complete fiction, observing that the manuscript is not in the medieval list of Beckett's books kept in the slag off the cloister. It wouldn't be, however, for it was in the care of the sacristan with the relics used in the liturgy. In fact, Beckett's was not a particularly big name in the Tudor period, when his name was more likely to be being erased from books rather than fraudulently invented. The wording is so close to that of the sacrist roll of 1321 that I do believe that there was indeed a medieval inscription probably hard to read if Parker's librarian had to have it transcribed to make it more legible. It was, as I said, doubtless on the front flyleaf in the Canterbury fashion. If the Psalter was for an archbishop's private use made for Elfridge, as I'm sure it was, it's very likely to have been inherited by his successor, Elfhair or Elfedge, archbishop from 1006, until his martyrdom by the Danes in 1012. It may very well have belonged to him too. In 11th century script, the ligature A-E looks very like N, especially if it's written in a flamboyant Saxon hand, unfamiliar to the personnel of Parker's household. 
The names of both Elfrich and Elfedge begin with A-E. Elfedge is an interesting man. He was born probably in Somerset around 953, and he became a hermit in Bath, where he was famous for his piety and saintly advice. Here he is with a psalter on his lap. In 984, he was made Bishop of Winchester, and in 1006, Archbishop of Canterbury. In September 1011, the Vikings laid siege to Canterbury, burnt the cathedral, and kidnapped Elfedge. He was taken to London, and on the 19th of April 1012, he was beaten to death at Greenwich, the first Archbishop of Canterbury to suffer martyrdom. This is the stained glass window at the event in the cathedral. In 1023, his possessions and relics were sent back to the custody of Canterbury. In 1078, Elfedge was canonised as a saint. I think the Psalter was almost certainly among his relics in its Anglo-Saxon jewel binding, because look, those 12th century additions at the end in the Canterbury script comprise unique readings for the passion or death of St Elfedge, otherwise inexplicable in a Psalter. See how the AE in line two could be mistaken for an N. Maybe then the added frontispiece, not obviously David, actually shows Elfedge holding his Psalter, added in 1023, venerated but not yet canonised. It gets better. In the 12th century, Elfedge was Thomas Becket's patron saint. When Becket became Archbishop in 1162, he consciously modelled himself on the reputation of his martyr predecessor, and if it existed, he would undoubtedly have taken the Psalter of St Elfedge into his own possession. There are contemporary accounts of Becket carrying a devotional book on his travels. I really think that the inscription is absolutely correct, and that this was indeed the Psalter of the Archbishops of Canterbury, and, as it says, that it came into the hands of Thomas Beckett. Finally, of course, I must ask the question, even if it's unanswerable, was Beckett actually holding this manuscript at the moment of his martyrdom? The event is well documented. In the last hours of his life, Beckett knows that it's all over. The four knights arrive noisily, clearly drunk, while the Archbishop is at dinner. Thomas Beckett then slips back to his bedchamber where he gathers up the regalia with which, by then, he knows he's about to die. His skull cap, his surplice, his dark cloak, his ring of office, and, it would be believable, his psalter of St Alfedge the Martyr. He goes through the side door of the cathedral. I peered closely at the antiquary's casket and I cannot see a book there, although it's very stylized. Medieval and later iconography of the murder does sometimes show a book in his hands, or open on the altar, or clattering to the ground. As Becket died, his absolute last words, at least according to one account, were to commend his soul into the care of St. St. Elphege. That might explain why the Psalter was kept on the shrine, rather than being sent with Becket's other manuscripts to the slime off the cloister, and why a book, a mere book, became a medieval relic. At the Reformation, the jewel binding must have been stripped off as the law required, but Matthew Parker, who was interested in archbishops but not at all in Psalters, doubtless requisitioned the manuscript for its known connection with the most famous medieval archbishop of Canterbury. 400 years earlier, Becket himself, already obsessed with martyrdom, had treasured the book for its previous ownership by the martyr Elfedge. In conclusion, I offer you an unpublished exclusive of what surely must have been one of the most evocative relics of medieval England and the only surviving object from Beckett's shrine. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christopher. I think I, I can genuinely say it's one of the most exciting talks we've had in these rooms for a long time, and what a wonderful path of discovery. Um, now, Christopher Hamill has said he would take some questions, so if anyone would like to ask questions, please go ahead. Uh, lady there? Yeah, I'm just going to say, first of all, the world authority on Thomas Beckett and Duggan is in the audience. I'll take questions from anyone except her. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there, there was a question here. Yeah. How many of them were actually monastic? 
Um, the question is really, what do we know about the commissioning of books during a relatively short period while Beckett was in exile? Of course, he was away for some years. Uh, we may tend to look at medieval manuscripts and think that they must have taken somebody years to write. But when we actually have accounts of people writing them, um, particularly if you were working for somebody as rich and powerful as Beckett, they probably, I bet you could write, I bet you could write one of those gloss, gloss books in a matter of weeks. Um, it must sometimes be a bit like having a suit made in Singapore or Hong Kong now. You know, it takes a few weeks, but if you pay extra, you can get it done overnight. Um, um, there are clearly two real sources of, of, of Beckett's books. There are those that the monks are making him in Ponsley, where he was for two years, and you can get quite a lot in two years. Um, particularly if, a, if, a, if, a, if a large number of people are working on them. Um, the other, others are those that he must have commissioned from professional painters, and those gloss books are really among the earliest professional, commercially made books, and they, these people were being paid to do it. Um, and I expect the word went out, this is what, and some, somebody, someone was behind it, and it could well have been John of Salisbury, someone like that, um, is going out and commissioning these books. Um, I don't think there's anything unlikely about a library being put together in two or three or four years um, of books as grand as that. Um, writing a book, say you could do it in a month, illumination would have taken a bit longer, but of course it's not illuminated, um, I mean, you know, the scribe writes the text, leaves a blank space, and it's given to the illuminator. So the illuminator can be working on, on the early pages while, while the scribe is still finishing writing it. Um, I, think it's, I think it's perfectly possible. It's just that moment in history when the monks are losing control, are losing the monopoly of learning, and we begin to get the very, very beginnings of a book trade. Um, I think Beckett's in there. There's a question from there. Uh, is there any record of Beckett giving books away? Um, the question is, is there any record of Beckett giving books away? I am not aware of any, but it was part of what bishops did. So um, Henry of Blois, um, exactly this period, was giving books to Glastonbury and to Winchester. Um, Hugh Puiset, a little bit later in the 12th century, gave fantastic books to Durham. Um, it was a kind of thing that um, uh, a Baldwin, Beckett's successor as archbishop, gave a number of books to Canterbury. Um, it would have been part of what a, a bishop would have done in a pastoral role. I don't think Beckett had enough time in a pastoral role. He was in political trouble. He was on the run. Um, maybe he planned to give some of these away and it all got out of hand. I don't, I don't know of any references to Beckett giving books away. Question over there. I, I said I wouldn't take any questions from her, but as she recounts this thing, <laughs> I feel a kind of shiver going down my spine. That wasn't a question, that is a statement, that Beckett goes back for a precious book. Of course, the word precious may mean precious emotionally, but it may also mean precious in, in, in metallic terms. Um, maybe, because it'd be quite, it'd be very portable. I mean, it's about that size. It's just, just the kind of, it's just the kind of book you take with you. It really is an extraordinary thing. He's probably already thinking about martyrdom, and that evocative association with this martyr's book must have mattered to him enormously. Um, that, in a way, may have a slight comment on the previous question about commissioning the library in France. Here may, may have been one book that he actually took with him, so maybe they weren't all, all commissioned in France. But that's a wonderful, wonderful reference, and I wish I'd known that. Yeah, at the back. William 
Yes. Yes. So I couldn't. I couldn't. I, yes. Uh, the question is, Sir William Hamilton. This is this is the Sir William Hamilton of of of, of Nelson fame, yeah. I assume. Yeah. Um, he was in Naples. He was. Um, he. I, I, I have no idea whether actually he, you expect you would imagine he would be more interested in classical antiquity than he would be in something medieval. But I, don't you? I could imagine he's in Naples and the turn of the 18th century, and he sees this very English thing and thinks that's amusing, uh, brings it back, and then thinks, I don't want it in the house, and gives it to the antiquaries. <laughs> I mean, um, but I, I, I don't actually know anything further about the history of that object, um, but it was given by him. I, I have a question for you, Christopher. Is your famously inaccessible library ever likely to exhibit this wonderful discovery? Um, our famously inaccessible library, I hope, is no longer inaccessible. My uh, successor may close it down. We're now open to the public every week. We have a permanent exhibition upstairs. Every single manuscript has been digitized. Every single page of every manuscript has been digitized and is available free on the internet. And the Beckett Psalter is currently on view right now. Wonderful. So, yes. Um, well, I'll, on that um, note, I think we should all rush to uh, King's Cross <laughs> to go to Cambridge. Um, and it's and um, I'm certainly going to try and do so myself. But I um, do also go to the British Museum to see the antiquaries' wonderful Beckett Chasse. Um, but shall we leave it there with um, a heartfelt thanks to Christopher Hamill for the most wonderful lecture today. Thank you.